Chapter 4 In Judea, a man with Joseph's political views could not possibly go to the races or the theater. On one occasion, he had attended an entertainment, secretly and with a bad conscience, in Caesarea. But what a wretched affair that had been compared with the spectacle he was watching now in the Marcellus Theater. His head reeled with the dancing, the ballet, the gigantic grandiose pantomime, the splendor of the perpetual changes on the huge stage, which during all those hours had never felt empty. Justice, who was sitting beside him, dismissed it all with a wave of the hand. The only item that he considered worth seeing was the burlesque review, which the people loved so much, and with justice. They had sat through all that had been presented to them till now simply to be sure of a place for the review in which the comedian Demetrius Lobanus was to appear. Yes, this man Demetrius Lobanus, repellent though he was in some ways, was a great artist and a human being. Born as a slave in the imperial household, and manumitted by the Emperor Claudius, he had amassed immense wealth and the title of the first comedian of the day. The Emperor Nero, whom he had instructed in the arts of acting and oratory, loved him. A difficult fellow, this Lobanus, exalted and humbled by his Jewish nationality. Not even the prayers and commands of the emperor could make him appear in public on the Sabbath or any of the Jewish holy days. He was always debating with doctors in Jewish universities whether he was really rejected by God because he played on the stage. When he had to appear in woman's clothing, thus violating the scriptural law, it cost him attacks of hysteria, for the Bible said that a man must not wear woman's clothing. Wearied by the long duration of the first part of the program, which had lasted for several hours, the 11,000 spectators in the Marcellus Theater now noisily and tumultuously demanded that the burlesque should begin. The theater manager hesitated, obviously because he was expecting the emperor or the empress, in whose box all the preparations had already been made. But the public had now been waiting for five hours. It was accustomed to stand up for its rights in the theater, even in the teeth of the court itself. It threatened and shouted. There was no choice but to begin. The curtain was parted. Demetrius Lobanus' great act commenced. It was entitled The Fire, and people said that the Senator Marullus was the author. The hero, played by Lobanus, was a slave called Isidar, belonging to the Egyptian city of Ptolemaeus a fellow superior in ability to his master and everybody about him. Lobanus acted almost without any theatrical aids, wore no mask or expensive frippery, not even the buskin. He was simply the slave Isidar from the province of Egypt, a melancholy sly fellow whom nothing could put out, and who stood his ground in every difficulty. He helped his slow-witted and unfortunate master out of countless embarrassments. He secured money and property for him, and slept with his wife. Once, when his master gave him a buffet on the ear, he declared, sadly and resolutely, that now he must leave him, and that he would not return until a public apology had been made. The master put his slave Isidar in chains and informed the police, but of course Isidar succeeded in escaping, and to the tumultuous delight of the audience, again and again led the police a dance. Unfortunately, at the most exciting point, when it seemed inevitable that the police would at last secure their man, the play had to be interrupted, for now the empress appeared. The whole audience arose, and with eleven thousand voices greeted the dainty fair lady, who with arm outstretched in the Roman fashion faced the audience and thanked them. Her appearance was a double sensation, for among those who accompanied her was the abbess of the Vestals, and hitherto it had not been customary for the aristocratic nuns to attend the popular burlesques in the Marcellus Theater. The play had to be started anew. Joseph was very pleased by this, for the quite brazen realism of the performance was overwhelmingly new to him, and he understood it the second time far better. His burning eyes remained fixed on the actor Lobanus, on his brazen and melancholy lips, on his eloquent hands, on his whole animated eloquent body. Now came the verse that everybody had been waiting for, the celebrated verse that Joseph in his short stay in Rome had already heard people singing, bawling, and whistling a hundred times. The comedian stood on the stage surrounded by eleven crowns, cymbals crashed, trumpets blared, flutes shrilled, and he sang the verse, Who is the master here? Who pays for the butter? Who pays for the girls? And who pays for the Syrian perfumes? The audience had leapt up, and they sang too, even the yellow-haired empress in her box moved her lips, and the dignified abbess laughed heartily. But now at last the slave Isidar was surrounded. There was no escape. The police were on every side of him. He declared that he was not the slave Isidar, but how was he to prove that to the policeman? By a dance. Yes, that was the idea, of course. And then came the dance. Isidar was still wearing the fetters round his ankles. So what he had to do was to dance and at the same time conceal his fetters, and that was terribly difficult, comic, and pathetic at the same time. For this man was dancing for his freedom and his life. Joseph was carried away. The audience was carried away. Every movement of the comedian was followed with breathless and sympathetic interest by the audience. Joseph regarded himself as an aristocrat through and through. He had not the slightest scruple in having the most menial services performed for him by slaves, nor had most of the people who were sitting in the theater. They had shown very clearly that they had no desire to obliterate the distinction between the masters and the slaves by having over 10,000 of the latter executed on one occasion. But now, as they watched the man in fetters passing himself off as a master, they were all for him and against his employer, and they all shouted with joy, these Romans and their empress, when the impotent fellow once more shook off the police and softly and slyly began to hum again. 
Who is the master? Who pays for the butter? And now the acting became quite unashamed. The master had published his apology and got back his slave. But in the meantime, he had committed many blunders. He had quarreled with his tenants, and they now refused to pay him his rent. Yet, for very good reasons, he dared not evict them, for his dear houses had depreciated greatly in value. Here, nobody could help him but the sly Isidar, and he did. The assistance he provided, however, was of the same kind that, according to popular opinion, the emperor and certain of the great courtiers had availed themselves of in a similar case. He set fire to the district where the depreciated properties lay. Demetrius Levanus played this part impudently and with verve. Every sentence contained some allusion to the land speculators and the great financiers who were coining money over the rebuilding of the city. Nobody was spared, neither the architects Solaris and Severus, nor the celebrated old statesman and writer Seneca, with his philosophical praises of poverty and his actual life of luxury, nor the financier Claudius Reginus, who wore a gigantic pearl on his third finger, but unfortunately had not enough money to buy shoelaces, nor even the emperor himself. Every word found its target, the audience shouted with delight and became breathless with laughter, and when at the end the comedian Labanus invited the audience to pillage the burning house on the stage, there was a riot such as Joseph had never seen before. The alluring interior of the burning house was turned towards the audience by an ingenious device. Thousands of people made a rush for the stage, flung themselves on the furniture, the table decorations, and the food. They trampled upon each other, shouting and screaming. And throughout the theater and the square in front, throughout the gigantic airy colonnades, over all the spacious campus marshes, the air rang with the words, Who is the master here? Who pays for the butter?